You have said that Fed policy, Jay Powell was the primary culprit, the pay, pace really of rate hikes from such a low base. But for you, is the risk of a systemic credit event still key? Has that been avoided? Well, I think uh, they're addressing the liquidity issue, but not really the solvency issue uh, from our point of view. Um, a couple of things have happened here that have never happened really in history, and so the banks didn't expect it. Uh, the first was interest rates up 19-fold in less than a year. Never happened. Under Volcker, which it was twofold, 10 to 20 percent. And the low base does matter. Many people dismissed it, saying, oh, just such a low base. No, expectations were low base. Mm. So that was the first. We've never seen that magnitude of uh, an earthquake, I would say. Then um, the second thing that no one expected, again, because it hasn't happened in such a long time, was deposits leaving the system. For Silicon Valley Bank, it was venture capital uh, facing a, a funding drought, and so they had to draw down their deposits. Uh, but then for others, you've got money market funds attracting, paying much higher than deposits, uh, attracting flows. So that combination yes. was, was lethal. Uh, and so now they have the backstop in. Now what do we have? Uh, we have the, um, they're going to be paying up if, they, if they're depending on the facility. They'll pay roughly 4.37% right now is that rate, OI, OIS plus 10. And, um, and that's much higher than many of them have, have been paying for deposits, number one. While in the case of Silicon Valley Bank, their average held to maturity security on the asset side of their balance sheet was only 1.6. So they're going to see net interest losses. Uh, now, instead yes. of having marked market hit equity, uh, the, these losses are going to hit earnings. Kathy, that's the cause. Let's go to the effect. Since the collapse of Silicon Valley yes. Bank, the market has changed its Fed expectations for a less hawkish or a more dovish Fed. You cite the Fed as the cause. How nimble are ARC being? How much are you recalculating your view going forward? Well, uh, as we said before COVID, uh, as we were descending into that, and we are saying now, Innovation solves problems. And you showed a few charts uh, at the beginning that suggest that uh, some of the innovators out there are solving problems. I mean, I think the most dramatic example of it to us was the behavior of Bitcoin uh, last week. It absolutely took off. It was a flight to safety uh, vehicle. Uh, and so uh, it is really proof of concept that innovation solves problems. There are, in, in Bitcoin, fully decentralized, tr fully transparent, auditable, uh, which is uh, uh, addressing all of the banking's problems right now. And so a flight to safety, a little bit of an insurance policy. There's no central point of failure in Bitcoin. Caroline, uh, ARK has 20, 30 calls on Bitcoin, the most bullish case around 1.5 million on Bitcoin, the most bearish around 250,000 on Bitcoin. Somewhere in the middle, you have around 682,200. That is the sort of base case there. Interesting at a time when no one is making that kind of long-term projection. Yeah, and Kathy, we know you're a long-term investor with long-term calls, but what on earth gets us to that bull case of almost one and a half million dollars per Bitcoin if a bank crisis doesn't? Uh, oh, uh, well, uh, one of the things that happens in a crisis is a liquidity dries up. So that, that uh, tends to hurt assets. And the fact that Bitcoin uh, moved uh, in a very different way from the equity markets in particular uh, was quite instructive. Uh, you'll find the, the building blocks of those price targets in our Big Ideas 2023. So ARC Big Ideas 2023. And they are... For the base case, uh, I would suggest quite conservative. 
Um, we've dialed some of them down since last year. I know that corporate treasuries uh, pulled away from Bitcoin because because the uh, regulators were pulling them away from uh, from Bitcoin on their balance sheet. So we've pulled back there. Uh, but we do believe that the behavior of the price through this crisis is going to attract more uh, institutions, for example. Uh, we've done a, a report targeting institutional investors and and an allocate the allocation that uh, they should make if they if they care about this new asset class diversity diversifying their portfolios. And uh, I believe it's somewhere between two and a half and six and a half percent. Mm. Uh, so not crazy. These are the sorts of allocations they would have made to emerging new categories of assets like real estate in the 70s, emerging markets uh, in and small cap in the 80s and 90s. And Kathy, I mean, Ed, let's discuss some of the ways that Kathy and Ark have invested and got exposure to crypto. Of course, there's the companies such as Coin Base, yeah. But there's also GBTC, the Grayscale, Bitcoin Trust. And regulation is in the eye of the storm there as well, Ed. I mean, talk us through what the SEC seems to be pushing us towards. Yeah, and Kathy made an interesting point there, right, about institutional investors. Kathy, if I remember correctly, back in 2021, a big part of your thesis on the run-up in Bitcoin was that more U.S. corporates would add it to their balance sheet in, case, in place of cash. That doesn't appear to have happened to the level that you'd hoped. Is that because the U.S. is just not of a regulatory friendly environment for this to happen? Yes, uh, you know, in the beginning of the crisis, it seemed like regulators wanted to blame crypto instead of the significant rise in interest rates and the deposit outflows. Uh, now we're seeing it uh, as a solution to the problem, but the regulators are still uh, are, are still reticent. Something interesting happened today, or maybe it was yesterday. Uh, Governor DeSantis uh, basically said that uh, he was going to uh, allow uh, uh, allow. I don't know if he said this exactly, but it, the conclusion of his saying we're going to set Florida apart from the rest of the nation uh, was this ability to touch companies that touch crypto. Uh, after all, these are cash deposits. They're fiat deposits. They're not crypto. And this can be done on a state-by-state -state basis. So I think you'll see Florida, uh, like it has done in many other ways, distinguish itself from the rest of the pack. <clears throat> Kathy, Katie Greifeld, my good friend and, and a, a just terrific reporter on the ETF Beats, has been talking about grayscale and the opening arguments in the case with the SEC. Um, in that discussion, how much are you considering adding to your position around trust? How are you reading how that grayscale situation is playing out? Uh, so it seems as though uh, the judge is having some trouble understanding how the SEC could approve a Bitcoin futures ETF, which is swaps based and therefore has counterparty risk. Um, but will not allow a spot Bitcoin ETF. It really makes no sense. So they'll either have to basically shut down the, the Bitcoin futures ETF, it seems to me, or allow uh, a Bitcoin ETF. So I think Grayscale is doing Bitcoin a great service and uh, its arguments have been very sound. We asked our audience, Kathy what they make of the behavior in Bitcoin. This was what they had to say in the terms of how the asset class behaves. Uh, is it a must have in a banking crisis? Few respondents said yes, no, it's too volatile was the main response. Caroline, interested in your take on that. What this all comes down to is how we're playing the interest rate environment, right? How we're reading the Fed, how we're reading across different asset classes. Yeah, and to that point, Kathy, you have said just earlier in the conversation, the rate of change of the Fed, the 19-fold increase in interest rates that have so upended, you say, in many ways, what's happening in the financial markets and financial conditions. But mm. we did see signaling from the Fed. They did tell us they were going to be hiking rates and hiking rate fast. Why then didn't you move your portfolio around more? Well, uh, the, the premise of the question is that we're an asset allocator. We are not. Uh, we invest 
exclusively in disruptive innovation, nothing else. What we did do was we concentrated our flagship strategy, so ARKK and, and our other strategies, ARKQ, ARKW, ARKF, and uh, we moved in the flagship's case from 58 names in February of 21, when we peaked, uh, down to 27, 28 names. Uh, we have a scoring system, and uh, the scoring system system is based on variables we believe are very important to innovation. Uh, and so we concentrated the portfolio. Many mm. people uh, in the traditional asset management world, when they go through a risk off period, they will diversify their portfolios uh, by moving closer to their benchmarks. What they're doing is typically selling our kinds of names. Yeah. And uh, so we that is why they're putting extreme pressure on them. Uh, we'll create losses by selling stocks, and that gives us a tax loss asset, which we have. It's over $2 billion right now against which we can take future gains, and then concentrate towards our highest conviction names. We have a paper on our site which shows the benefits of this concentration strategy during risk off and diversification strategy during risk on. But, of course, when it's risk off, you've underperformed, and actually even on a five-year basis. I know people will say, look, you're already looking in a long period, five-year outlook kind of perspective, but look back from here over the last five years, and yes, it's been a turbulent time, it's been an interest rate hike time, but you've underperformed the S&P 500. What do you say to those that have a shorter time frame in terms of investing, those that are looking to retire in the next five to 10 years? Should they be with you, or do we have to be long-term equity investors that have a much longer runway to get have exposure to ARK Investments. So we're the closest thing to a venture a, a strategy to a venture capital fund in the public equity markets. And uh, a venture fund has a long-term investment horizon. If uh, an investor cannot have that long-term an investment horizon, uh, then they should allocate perhaps a small amount to our strategy, say one or two percent, uh, which, by the way, mo from what we can tell, uh, most advisors have us at that one to three percent range. Now, um, why would you put any if the risk was the volatility that you see on this chart? It is because our companies are going to disrupt the traditional world order. And if we're right, then the large cap benchmarks right. and even some of the mid caps, uh, 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 mid cap funds are going to be disrupted. We will be a hedge. Now, uh, you'll, I will say and submit to you that last year was the most unusual year of my investment career. And not only mine, but bond investors. So bond investors had the worst year in, uh, yes. in, in uh, 200 and some odd years. Uh, when interest rates go up 19-fold in less than a year, uh, it's going to kill long-duration assets. Bonds are long-duration assets. Uh, they've never seen a year like that. ARC is a long-duration asset. Uh, but if we're right and these companies are going to disrupt the traditional world order, uh, then we want to be on the right side of change, and the market will come our way, away from those benchmarks, which represent the traditional world order, to our strategies. For our global TV and radio audience, we're speaking with Kathy Wood, CEO of ARK Investment Management. Kathy, in June on stage at Up Summit, you cited retail inventory levels, and you told me, to, if you remember, that inflation would unravel. Did you get that one wrong? No, if you look at if you look at upstream what's going on, commodity prices are coming down quite dramatically, some by 70, 80 percent. Uh, and I would also say the, the retail call was very right. I think I think you'll agree on that. Uh, the discounting, we think is going to continue to work its way through the system from the commodity price level uh, to downstream near the consumer. And you can see this 
Tesla is cutting prices. Many people say, oh, it's because of competition. No, it's because their commodity prices are coming down. Uh, and, and Elon's even talking about deflation. And the, the, the cost associated with innovation is coming down because it follows a learning curve. So I think the innovation that our companies uh, is de uh, are delivering uh, right. are going to be one part of the deflation. Commodity prices, another. And I will also tell you, the yield curve, it last, the week before last, was down, uh, inverted by as much more than 100 basis points. That also is a deflationary signal, as is what's now going on in the banking system. Yes. I think the banking system is fearing deflation. Well, Kathy, to that note, we've been talking about sort of a de facto tightening of financial conditions in the wake of Silicon Valley Bank. You moved last year to give investors exposure to venture funds, private firms, in that partnership with Titan. Has that proved to be bad timing? How impacted has that been from SVB? And we've only got a couple of minutes left. Sure. Uh, well, we're fledgling still. It, it takes a long time. We have, as you say, with uh, Titan, a social distribution stra strategy. We have other wrappers as well. I much prefer to start a strategy during tough times. And actually, now we can be a solution uh, if we get inflows, people looking for venture, for they can get into our venture fund for only $500. So, uh, again, the democracy of investing uh, and this idea public uh, closest to a venture capital fund in the public markets to be able to actually do a venture fund at a time that the venture community needs us. Uh, if you look at Silicon Valley Bank, uh, that situation has robbed a lot of venture capitalists of, of funding. Has it and robbed the, the U.S. of innovation, Kathy, do you think? It's, uh, I would say that regulations threaten to do that, and certainly in the crypto space, absolutely. But I also think the seizing up is not just a U.S. phenomenon. Uh, it looks like it's more of a global phenomenon, judging what uh, has just happened in Europe. So it's not as much that. It is regulation, uh, the likes of which we're seeing around okay. blockchain technology, that okay. threaten U.S.'s position in innovation. Kathy, very quickly, did you have any exposures to SVB? None whatsoever. Uh, well, okay. I'll say, as our business, okay. no, and our company's very limited okay. exposure. I was so surprised okay. I just and delighted to, clarify. to see how little. Although yes. Roku I just wanted to clarify that for our audience, Kathy. I'm sorry to jump in, but we got to go. Kathy Wood, CEO of Ark Invest, we're really grateful for your time here across Bloomberg Television and Radio. Thank you.